Hello everybody, my name is Rob Daywald. I'm going to be your instructor. I uh, wanted to check in with you and uh, share some videos from time to time. I found that these are pretty helpful. Uh, I hope that um, um, you get some benefit of it. First of all, I want to share a little bit about myself. I started out in probation as a probation officer a long time ago in juvenile court. Uh, much of the time back then, there really wasn't a whole lot of uh, programming. You were just kind of up to yourself, figure stuff out. I usually had about 60 clients. I talked to a lot of these young probation officers today. They may have about 300, but they have a lot more tools uh, that can help them. Uh, and this is that they have uh, uh, places for people to go as far as treatment. Uh, that's kind of more what I, I work in today. Um, and then they are involved heavily in what we call case management. So things have really changed in the years that I've been watching this. And one of the things I'd say is that, like in my early days, I would just try to come up with ideas. Like for instance, I had a client that was a shoplifter, he's a young kid. Uh, and so I gave him a 50 gallon trash bag and said, you know, go into the parking lot of the store where you shoplifted. You're not allowed in the store, but you are allowed in the parking lot. So we tried this for a while. I thought it was a really good uh, good thing, but one thing we started to notice is some of these kids would come in and turn in their big trash bag as a way of uh, doing their community service, and I would look in it and it was full of popcorn and pop, uh, and one of the things I started thinking was, well, you know, if I was picking up trash in a parking lot, I'd be finding uh, cups that have been run over by a car uh, or sandwich wrappers run over by a car, muddy, dirty. Uh, none of this stuff that this kid was turning in uh, was dirty in any way. So I'm thinking, I think this kid just went into a movie theater and just traded 50-gallon bags uh, of trash and just took the trash uh, out of one of the big trash cans and brought it in and turned it in. So I guess, you know, uh, larceny lives, you know, in the uh, recesses of the mind. So if he's once a shoplifter, always a shoplifter. I don't want to say that, but I did have a conversation with him and soon we figured out that it was a lot different. Um, it wasn't going to be uh, find the easy way out. So another friend of mine was a probation officer, and he got this great idea, uh, which was he, he got the county to give him 14 acres of land, and then he made a garden in there, and he made every uh, teenager on probation go in and hoe the garden, had to hoe the garden. So basically, uh, through the whole summer, they would work and work on this, and then as it got to be toward the fall, they would start to harvest the crops, and the crops would be used in the uh, old folks home or uh, maybe a place for people with uh, uh, developmental disabilities or even in the jail, you know, even in the juvenile detention. They would have fresh vegetables because of the work that they had done in this um, big garden that he created. And this went on for many, many years. And uh, it's funny because I've seen that other places have picked that up and a lot of these restorative justice programs that we see that are modern ideas um, really are real similar to what my friend was doing way back in the 70s, 60s even, in 70s, all the way up through the 90s where he was having uh, kids get in trouble, go down and hoe in the garden, you know. It was always called, you got to go hoe in Ernie's garden, you know. So everybody knew what that meant. So as we look at chapter one, we want to look at uh, some things. Uh, one of the important things in chapter one that they emphasize is that, um, you know, a lot of people uh, uh, in the 70s uh, started to get into trouble. And it jumped uh, from 1973 up to about 1990, actually. Uh, and... Um, so uh, in the early stages, they said it's 96 people per 100,000 Americans. Well, by 2010, it was 500 people 
per 100,000. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that crime went up. Uh, what happened was that, on the one hand, yeah, crime did go up. Uh, for one thing, we created new crimes, and there was a lot of drug crimes and things like that. But also then they started really, and they being, uh, for one example, the Congress, really cracked down on nonviolent drug crimes. Uh, for instance, if people were involved in selling crack cocaine, even though it was uh, nobody was being hurt, uh, basically they were getting huge sentences, like 50 years in prison, for something that in uh, in the 30s it was totally legal. So um, a lot of this is just the, the way that we look at things. It's not necessarily that something uh, has has uh, really changed. It's just for whatever the, the the powers that be say, well, this is going to be a crime. And, you know, this is what we call a malum prohibitum crime. You guys should know what that means by, you know, it's prohibited by law. Um, someone says it's wrong, that's why it's wrong. You know, malum and say crimes, on the other hand, murder, rape, uh, theft, things like this, we just know we're born and we know these are wrong, you know. We learn it in our early childhood. Uh, and so those are usually your violent crimes or your very serious crimes. So those are things to keep in mind as we look at uh, the early parts of chapter one of your book. Um, you know, it says that, uh, you know, there's a number of people on death row. One of the things about, you know, death row, there, there's um, a gradual, gradual reduction in the number of states that uh, want to use uh, the death penalty in even the most serious crimes. Uh, a very interesting example is Illinois. Uh, Illinois did away with the uh, death penalty because they learned that something like 20 of the people that they had on uh, death row were actually innocent, completely innocent, based on DNA evidence. And the thing about DNA, DNA is really having uh, an adverse effect on um, the death penalty. And a lot of people are saying, "Well, I don't know. I, if we aren't, if we can't be sure that somebody did something, then we shouldn't use the death penalty." Uh, another nice thing, though, about DNA is that we're actually solving some of these crimes. Even years later, uh, we're finding people, uh, and there's all kinds of arguments that go on about DNA, but. This is what we're looking at as evidence-based or really scientific um, types of, uh, of evidence instead of like, uh, well, I think that was the man, you know, and, and stuff like that. So it's changing a lot in these days. It's really important. So as we look at corrections, we need to keep in mind that we're really not as concerned about the offense other than we're concerned about the level of offense. So what I, what I mean by that is, was it a violent offense? Was it a nonviolent offense? Uh, these are things that uh, are important to us because we have to decide, you know, what will be the punishment. The issue of guilt also has already been resolved. That's not our problem. Uh, punishment, on the other hand, I think in the modern world that we live in may not be uh, that big of an, uh, uh, of, uh, 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 I don't want to say that big of a word, but it may not be, let's say it may not be an apt word or it may not be an accurate word because a lot of the people we're dealing with today, especially nonviolent people, are not engaged in punishment at all. They're engaged in treatment. They need mental health treatment. They need substance abuse treatment. So a lot of times when we get involved in this, we have to be careful about our terminology. And I think sometimes we've just kind of defaulted to a term like punishment when it's really not um, the most accurate term. Uh, might be uh, more of a, a word like outcome uh, or something like that might be a more accurate word. Well, this is just some of my initial thoughts on the um, uh, first few uh, chapter words that we have and uh, ask you to just kind of mull it over. I'll be back with some more of these, um, and um, I'm going to go down through all the material in your book and, and, uh, and try to give you some um, uh, important concepts that I can share with you.
So I hope you enjoy this. Let me know if you have questions. P. Period. Daywalt at snhu.edu is my current email address. Thanks for paying attention. Stay in touch. And let me know if you have questions. Bye now.